Welcome to Electron Online. In this video, we're going to compare what we call the covariance matrix to the concept of standard deviation. Remember, the relationship is that the standard deviation is basically the square root of the variance, and it's the variance that makes up the variance covariance matrix. Or in other words, we have along the diagonal the variances, and offset from the diagonal, we have what we call the covariances. If there's more than one type of measurement, for example, measurement for position and measurement for velocity, we can have x represent position, y represent velocity, and then we compare the variances between the variables to come up with what we call the covariances. But the whole concept is the following. If we go to the graph here, here we see the, the black curve that represents a distribution of the various measurements that we take, and if the, the distribution is very narrow, in other words, if there's very small variation between the readings of the measurements that we take, then this will be a very narrow curve, and the standard deviation will be very small. In other words, the standard deviation will be very small distance away from the average or the mean of all the readings. If there's a lot of variation in the readings, then the standard deviation will be large. Now we have the blue curve. Instead of having a sharp, narrow curve, we now have a wide curve like this, which means there's a lot of variation in the readings. There's a strong relationship between that concept and the concept of variances. The difference is that with standard deviation, you can say that 68% of all the values that you're going to read fall within the plus or minus one sigma, one standard deviation. If you go out two standard deviations, it's about 95%. If you go out three standard devi deviations, you have more than 99% of all the readings of all the measurements that you take. The variances are different. The variances are the square of these standard deviations, which puts the variances much further out. As you can see here, if this is the distribution of all the readings or all the measurements, then plus or minus the variance will actually include just about all of the measured values. So when we use variances and covariances in the Kalman filtering, what we're saying is we want to get a feel of how far away from the mean or the correct value we can expect the readings to be or the measurements to be. When the measurements become more accurate, then the, then the variance, of course, becomes smaller, the standard deviation becomes smaller, and then the standard deviation squared becomes smaller as well. To get a feel for it numerically, here we have five measurements. Let's just use one variable, the x, and we're going to go through these various processes to see how to come up with the variances and the covariances. Well, in this case, since we only have one variable, we can only come up with variances. So the average of the measurements can be found, which is also called the mean, by summing all the readings together, 2 plus 4 plus 5 plus 7 plus 7, and divided by the number of readings, in this case there is 5, that's 14, 19 plus 6, 25 divided by 5, so the average of the mean is 5. Now what we're going to do is calculate the deviation from the average for every one of those readings. So for the first one, we get uh, the average minus 2, and that is equal to 3. We take the average minus 4, the difference is 1. We take the average minus 5, the difference is 0. We take the average minus 7, the difference is 2. I know that the difference is negative 2, but we just want the magnitude of the difference. Since we're going to square the number anyway, we don't care if it's negative. And finally, we get 5 minus 7 equals 2. Again, that's the deviation from the mean. What we're going to do now is we're going to sum them all up. We're going to square them, sum them all up, and divide by n. So now we can say that the variance for the value, for the, for the value of x which is uh, the variance, which is sigma squared, is equal to the sum of all the deviations squared. So it would be 3 squared plus 1 squared plus 0 squared plus 2 squared plus 2 squared, and divided by the number of readings that we have, which in this case is 5. So the variance is equal to, that would be 9 plus 1 plus 0 plus 4 plus 4 divided by 5 which is equal to 10, that would be 18 divided by 5, which is equal to 3.6. This virtually guarantees, that's what the variance really means if you think about it, this virtually me, uh, guarantees that no value will fall outside plus or minus 3.6 added and subtracted from the average 5. For example, if the mean is 5, if we add plus 3.6 to it, we get 8.6, and if we subtract 3.6 from it, we get in this direction, I'll just put arrows on there, this direction we get 1.4.
Is it the case that all the values, all the measured values fall between 1.4 and 8.6? The answer is yes. And that's what the variance means. The variance means that you have included all of the possible values you're expecting to read, not for certainty, but pretty, that's a pretty good chance that that will be the case. Instead, if we take the square root of 3.6, 3.6, take the square root, that's actually, oh, let me do it again, 3.6, take the square root, I get um, 1.9, basically. So if we take the square root of 3.6, we get 1.9, approximately. That would be the standard deviation. So standard deviation would be equal to 1.9, and the variance would be equal to 3.6. If we add 1.9 to 5, 5 plus 1.9, we get 6.9, and if we subtract it from the other side, minus 1.9 on this side, we get 3.1. Theoretically, 68% of all the values should fall between 3.1 and 6.9. In this particular case, that's not even true. Only two out of the five fall within that region, because the number is so small, there's only five of them, it's likely that that will, not, you know, that that will happen. But at least you can see here that when you use plus or minus one standard deviation, it only represents about 68% of all the values. If you use plus or minus the variance, then you pretty well include all the possible readings that you expect to find. That's the concept of the variance. And now in the next videos, we're going to use this information to start building variance and covariance matrices with some real examples to see how they're formed and how we use them to come up with the Kalman gain. And that's how it's done.